Every year you have failures, right? Like sometimes things don't go quite according to plan. I had uh, one of my absolute favorite lenses uh, fall out of my, my hands onto the floor and break the <laughs> night before, like my biggest wedding of the yeah. season. And I really needed that lens, man. I, yeah. uh, that was a fail. That was a, man, I regret doing that still. <laughs> yeah. Did you have a backup? Well, I did, but like, so it was the 5612 that I dropped. And the backup that I have for it is the 50 f2, so like, it serves the same focal distance purpose, essentially, but it's not the same, you know what I mean? Like, the focus is not as much, yeah. and like, the image quality to me isn't quite as good. And then it was my biggest wedding of the season, so I really wanted to rock on it. And Yeah, you kind of wanted, um, yeah, I mean, I think failures happen at times that they're, you know, like the worst possible times, I mean. Right, when you're at least yeah. expecting them. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> when yeah, like everything's I'm, going so well. Yeah, I'm starting to get a little bit concerned about hard drive failures. So I do have a time machine backup, and I used to do cloud backing up, but I don't know. It just it kind of just took too long, and I wasn't like I didn't. Yeah, the internet's quite fast enough yet. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, for sure. So that wasn't really an effective strategy. So I'm only at two backups right now, and I have uh, these uh, two RAID setups, and they're both RAID five, but. It's still like a little bit worrisome because I have about 10 terabytes of data right now. So if one of those goes, then the chances of uh, the other hard drives going are pretty high because I bought them all at the same time. So I'm trying to look into like a second uh, backup uh, now. To prevent failure. Yeah, to prevent failure. So <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think... You can uh, prevent failure. I mean, that's always the best way. But sometimes yeah. you can't prevent failure. It just yeah. Happens. A couple of years ago... Um, I didn't have my personal work backed up because that wasn't really like a priority for me. Like it was only a priority to back up client work basically. Right, in case they came knocking in the future. Yeah, but uh, I, I took all these photos in Iceland and I edited oh, you lost those pictures? I did. Oh, I edited right. about 10 of them and exported the JPEGs. And so the only things I have uh, from that whole trip I shot for for three weeks are about 10 pictures. So, <laughs> but. Oh, man, um, that sucks. Well, you got the yeah. memories. I, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you have to go back there. At least it, at least it wasn't Aurora time here. Yeah, uh, I, I don't know if I'd be too interested in shooting Auroras. But that's no, that's really not. My thing, but yeah, that'd be pretty cool, man. Like I that's like a once in a lifetime. Yeah, thing, I guess night photography isn't my thing, but I failed yeah. a lot at night photography. <laughs> oh man, let me tell you, I have failed. Let me tell you about a time that I failed miserably at night photography. It was uh, a couple years ago when Zeiss contacted me about doing the Milvis stuff. And they sent me a whole bunch of their new prime Milvis lenses before they came out to go out and test. And I just had them for like, I want to say a week. And or maybe it was two weeks. And it was the week it was the week that my little brother was getting married. So like all these people were in town. I didn't have like very much time to mm -hmm. really get out and do it and stuff and do everything the way I wanted to. But I, want, I planned in my mind, I was like, I'm going to go do eight or nine epic shoots with these lenses and try to get a feel for them all and, and everything. And one of the nights, it was like a Friday night, I went out to do some night shots of some like astrophotography. And I, you know, I used the map and figured out how far it was away and stuff. And I made sure I got into all those spots. But I didn't know about the moon at that time and I got there and it was a full moon that night and it was ruining all my exposures and I drove like two and a half hours from home I left at like nine o'clock I got home at like two o'clock in the morning with no pictures and the next morning I had to go to like a brunch with my family and stuff <laughs> total fail man I went out and did this whole thing and I was like I'm gonna really like wow the people at Zeiss with this photo you know they're gonna they're gonna love it I got home and it was like the worst pictures I'd ever taken I was just like embarrassed yeah. to even yeah, I suppose that's what it. I kind of don't like about night photography is like, uh, it's kind of like the same reason I don't like, like wildlife photography. So like the wildlife photographer is waiting there and right. uh, just waiting for that one chipmunk to come out to the lake or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> right there's like a and lot of variables yeah yeah i like to like go 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 and i just get bored if i have to like uh get there and wait yeah around or and, and i don't like the planning to and like you have to do a lot of planning with astrophotography yeah. and you everything know, has to be yeah. just right the stars have to align you know? yeah for sure mm -hmm. but you know at least um with like something like, like street photography or uh portraits and stuff you can you can kind of just like go 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 even if you're not getting it perfect you're still occupied and you're working on something the whole time so that's kind of what I like about that stuff. But yeah, I don't know. I've never seen a night photo that made me feel too much except for like like NASA photos and stuff too. I guess like that's the other thing I'm not like too too into with night photography. But yeah, um, have you ever had a hard drive failure? I've been pretty lucky. I don't have too many hard drive failures. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason is because I tend to back everything up twice. Mm -hmm. And I tend to back it up on drives that I unhook from my system. 
and they just sit in a drawer so they're not like on all the time so that kind of limits that kind of problems i actually uh was a computer engineer before i was a photographer and mm -hmm. i worked a lot in data so i know kind of <laughs> thresholds of hard drives and stuff so i just try not to let that happen too much but you know i've had plenty of other technical failures i've had lots of shutters go out on weddings i've had lots of stuff like that where you needed fortunately i had backup cameras but if i only had one camera i would have been yeah i, I mean i would have been totally screwed yeah i had uh what was it i think one one wedding where i had a corrupted card and like i reformatted it and it was fine after that but um yeah i always shoot dual cards now i couldn't yeah you uh, don't want to take a chance on something like that but some, especially if you're doing wedding or event or like once in a lifetime photography like if you don't get another chance for that photo like yeah yeah, not having backups is like two, the very 2012 uh, while you're shooting. So yeah, it's just you're just setting yourself up to be in, in pain at some point. Like there's gonna be a point where it's not gonna work <clears> right, and you're gonna you're gonna regret it. You know? Yeah. So I feel like that's a failure that I don't really allow. Like I try to do everything I can to <laughs> to prevent that failure at all costs. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Um, another good strategy for for backups is definitely smart previews too. So if you build smart previews in your Lightroom catalog, yeah, yeah, yeah there's still I think. I think you can 12. deliver smart previews. You can, yeah. Yeah, if you needed to. Yeah, I've been on on the go. Depending and on been... who you're delivering it for and what its use is. I mean, if you needed to do it for like a big magazine or a billboard or something, you might not be able to. Yeah, I mean, you don't want to, you want to like, um, ideally like deliver like the bigger files later on. But when I used to work off a laptop, I would, if I was like traveling or something and like I just wanted to get something out, then I would deliver uh, smart previews because the smart previews were always on my computer, whereas like right. I had the big files like back at home. So if I wanted to deliver like uh, that night in the hotel where I was editing or whatever, give like a preview, then I would come back home and reopen. Yeah, and the if they're just going to only look so, at it like on a computer or an iPad or iPhone or something like that, yeah. a smartphone, then all they're going to need is those smart preview size. Like they're not going to need, like if they're printing it, they would need yeah. more. Yeah, I, I can guarantee you that probably every single client that I deliver to is looking at their photos first on an iPhone. Right? Oh, always, yeah. I, mean, I, look, I rarely <laughs> yeah. look at anything yeah, They're, they're not going to make a print order that night. So if you have yeah. like a day or two, you can, and you're working off a laptop yeah. and your big files are at home, you can always deliver a smart preview. So. Right. But yeah, um, I think, so uh, other failures, eh? Other failures. failures. How about oh. creatively? Have you had any creative failures? Like tried something and it just sucked. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, all the time. So, uh, Right now, I'm working on um, sort of, I don't really know what it is, but I'm, I'm looking for photos that make me me feel something, right? So mm -hmm. um, I have about four. About the feeling more than that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, I have about four photos that, uh, you know, I've said, like, make me, make me feel something. And then I have four photos that are really technically good, and they're, like, good compositions and stuff. But I'm looking at these, and I'm like, I just, like, like, like they're not there. So, like, you know, when I'm shooting personal work, like 99% of what I shoot is a failure. <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, you yeah. never know because you're just out trying yeah. new things. Yeah, and like uh, people in this like social media age, they're looking at Instagram and it's the highlights of everybody's life, right? So right, yeah. you know, you, you don't What's see all those to? failures, and so yeah, you just yeah, rarely do people put that out. I mean, there are some people, but most of the time you don't see somebody's. Yeah, yeah. Fails. Yeah, I'd say publicly um, and, displayed like that. Yeah, this podcast, um, I wouldn't call it a, a failure uh, yet, but um, <laughs> don't say yet. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I, there's some days where where I come here and uh, I'm, you know, I'm just like, how are we going to make it through this first section and a half an hour section? And you know, so I mean, every day you're going to have little things. Yeah, there's always little gonna, things that you have to yeah, like and you're going to and... yeah, and you know, at shoots or uh, podcasts or stuff, there's always times where I'm going to be like, oh, I should have said this, I should have said that, why didn't I do that? So, or you like get into a shoot and things start kind of going the wrong way and you're not getting the shots you want and mm -hmm. then you kind of, if you could let it like progressively get worse or you could realize that and then just go back to things that you would normally do for that shoot. Just like, all right, I'm not in my element today. Because there's yeah. some days where I get out and man, I'm just killing it. I'm just making great shots. Stuff is new and different and I'm really feeling well about my photos and there's days when I get out and I'm just not feeling that confident about photography and it's yeah. just more of a struggle. Yeah, it's uh for, for me it's kind of it's kind of weird cuz a lot of times I think that I'm uh be, like I'm not shooting well, but then when I get home and I look at my photos, I'm like, or like a week or two later, you yeah. look through and I'm like, oh, I killed. But, that. but it's what like, I yeah. I mean, for, for me, this like sort of I don't want to call it anxiety, but um, for me, this sort of feeling of like, oh, I'm not doing good enough. I'm not doing good enough right. is actually kind of beneficial, which is you know push me ahead of other photographers. Try a little harder. Yeah, yeah. So you know, I kind of a lot think that like 
oh, what, what I'm doing is crap. So, um, <laughs> so it makes me try harder and like, uh, makes me like, you know, move around more and stuff. So, yeah. It's funny. Even right. if you have like a big social following and you have yeah. people all the time are like, this is great. You're amazing. This is so good. You still can go out and be like, man, it's horrible. I'm really not doing well today. Like I really don't feel like I'm, I'm living up to yeah. what I could be shooting. I definitely have days like that. And I definitely feel like there's days where it's not like that and it's just really working. You know? Yeah. Usually, if I feel like I'm doing like really well, I'm actually not doing as well as when I think I'm doing. <laughs> you know, like, too much confidence. I, yeah. I yeah. Think, <laughs> yeah. I think I'm this a, right now. Yeah. I, I think that's kind of unique to, to me, possibly. But uh, interesting. Yeah. <laughs> I tend to be the other way. Yeah. I tend to. Anyway. Yeah. So, uh, what other failures have you had? Uh, maybe failures in business. I'd say we had a, a, a cooperative failure in business with our headshot business that we got going a bunch of years ago. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I'd say. Being impulsive is is good to an extent because <laughs> you're, you're going out there and you you have you're this, trying you're, you're trying things. you have this yeah. confidence you're gonna do this you're gonna do it and then sometimes it doesn't work out though yeah, and sometimes, sometimes you just fall when, down. What, what I've learned over the last two years is um, I can be kind of impulsive so <laughs> and I can really think that I'm like gonna you know uh, I, I don't know I have a tendency to think that I'm gonna make like like thousands and thousands of dollars in, in certain things and I, you know if I do it this way then you know I'm just kind of headstrong sometimes so I, I don't slow down too much and with that headshot business um, I don't think we we thought it all the way through so we were right. uh, you know charging X amount and then we were having to you know of course like split the profits too right. so it's like and we had another person doing the shots for us like we basically just built mm. the business yeah and then we just kind of ran it in our back pocket yeah and, and I think like with our wedding photography businesses on the startup there, it, like it was just, we kind of just fell into a model that, that works. Right. So you're like a, like one person and you go out and shoot and it just kind of makes sense. But then going into new business ventures, like not everything's going to like hit like that. So you got to think a little bit more. And also I think that you have to be more passionate about it. Cause I think we're mm -hmm. both really passionate about our wedding businesses and our own personal stuff. Yeah. But I think that when we built the headshot business, we both, we're more like, okay, we can build this machine. This machine can make us some money. And we weren't as invested in it as we were in ourselves and the things that we create ourselves. And I think that kind of contributed to the failure of it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's like, um, when, when I showed up, you know, we got paid, um, I think it's okay to talk about this, like about a thousand dollars to show up and shoot headshots for like a big real estate um, agency. And, um, we show up there and they, they want like a white background, uh, it was like there was like a certain gray and yeah. they had to match the gray and stuff. Right. And uh, when we showed up there and did that, I didn't realize what we were doing, uh, but it, it was basically school headshots for corporate people. So. <laughs> it became very repetitive and boring. Yeah. And that's why we outsourced it to people that could shoot for us. But like, we yeah. didn't care enough about it to let it really. And after a while, I think we both realized that it wasn't for us, and we closed that business. Yeah, if you're if you're passionate about it, you're gonna you know spend some more time perfecting it. You're gonna kind of just get into it more, and you're and not... you might put like more of your heart and soul and like extra time off and stuff into it. Like if yeah. it's something that you're just trying to do to make money and stuff, you're just gonna do the bare minimum. But if it's something you really love, mm -hmm. and you you know you're gonna work overtime and late into the night or something for it, then. You're probably gonna excel at that because you really care. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah like like weddings for me, I kind of look at it like um, like like a like a service. So like I'm providing a service to right. to these customers, and it's like uh, right. that's is, how I think of it too. It's yeah, like, it's always a, a goofy analogy. They want our skills to, to, yeah. to record their day. You know. Yeah, it's always a goofy analogy. But um, if you're a hairdresser and you um, are getting into the monotony of hairdressing, right? So you're cutting a hair every day or whatever and you're just kind of doing it over and over and there's no meaning behind it you're going to be really miserable yeah but if you're a hairdresser you who wants to uh you know you look at it like a service like you're bettering somebody's life you're giving them a new haircut or you know making them feel a little bit better about themselves then um then you're gonna uh you know just have more meaning in your line of work and stuff too so like right yeah i guess uh wedding weddings for me it's like i'm trying to create like a really awesome product for clients and trying yeah to for their most stuff. important day i want to yeah. record the best yeah. copy of the most artistic shots I yeah, can make for them. yeah for sure and yeah, there's totally. always like you know that there's always a little bit of adrenaline going into it like i gotta yeah. do good I gotta, yeah, I gotta this is a once yeah. in a lifetime i can't screw up i gotta yeah I gotta, for sure Bring Whereas, my a game. I usually will take the day off before a wedding if I can. Oh, me too. And just kind of like unwind and chill out, maybe watch the movies I like and relax yeah. a little. And that way on the wedding day, I'm pretty clear headed and I'm ready to 
do my best, you know? Yeah. Um, have you ever booked too many weddings in a year? Like, where you... Uh, yeah, well, sometimes it's funny because for us, it's not so much in a year, but more like some months. Like, sometimes, like, I had one September where I booked 11 weddings, which was too much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was that was too much. Like, if you're a wedding photographer and you do 11 weddings in a month and you have a 30-day return, that's too many. Like, that's that was too many to do, you know? Um, I feel like nowadays we try to kind of keep it to the seven limit. I would say six, That's seven. That's a good number. As long yeah. as we have that kind of under control, because uh, it's so seasonal here, you never get to a point where you're going to, like, overfill your off-season. So, like, I want to tr try to take as many as I can during the busy summer months, but I don't want to do so many where I can't realistically keep up or where I feel so drained that I'm causing more failures because I can't perform as well. Yeah. What, one thing I've realized is that the, the more years that I do wedding photography, the, le the less I, I want to book. So, like, in my third year i did six weddings in 10 days and yeah, that's rough man that's yeah rough. so especially like with two, the driving and stuff yeah two triple headers two like two weekends um all, all across colorado like staying in hotels and then just like waking up the next day like go 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 yeah that's hard yeah on you. a lot of 10 hour days um not too many short ones i think the shortest one during that stretch was like eight hours and so i mean you could yeah. really do that your whole life like that's like a younger person kind of way i mean like if yeah. you were like in your 50s or 60s i don't know i mean sure there's probably wedding photographers that still do it but that would be hard on you yeah i i don't i don't want to say i don't have the energy for it anymore but uh in my third year compared to i think i'm going to my fifth or sixth year now like i just had I was able to do it then and like go 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 now now mm -hmm. I got to kind of like slow down like don't burn out don't burn out because right because you want to yeah. keep doing it yeah for sure but anyways on the topic of failures I can definitely think of one other failure that I've had in the last couple of years and that was uh, thinking that I wanted to work destination weddings so mm, right yeah, yeah. I, I remember that failure yeah so uh, looking at uh, at Instagram you can when you were of, doing like the the simultaneous thing. Like the, uh, yeah, the I was split working between Arizona and Colorado. Yeah, yeah, I was. Uh, so that was like more regional though than really destination. Like you mm, were trying to like yeah. own I've done two some regions. Stuff in, I've yeah. seen a lot of photographers on uh, wedding photographers specifically that'll yeah. do regional. That'll do like two areas. Like you were. You were yeah, I mean that on. that was kind of the the first step and the second step. I thought was going to be to uh, do more destination stuff. Like I've done stuff in Florida too, and done some stuff like just kind of kind of around other than Colorado, but. Um, but yeah, that was kind of the plan, like do Arizona and then build up, show that I can work like two different regions and then go into destinations. But the thing is, is like, it looks cool on Instagram. So right, right. You, you, uh, you get started on wedding photography and... Or if you're like really like to travel, like if you're like a jet setter, like that could be cool. But like... Yeah. Are you traveling though? You're showing up and... You're not traveling. You're getting there. You're working the whole time. Yeah. And, unless, of course, you can like figure out uh, to stay a couple extra days, but that's going to be on your dime, which you're not going yeah, to do Yeah, you're not going to make any money. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, what I found was um, I would uh, usually show up two nights early. Um, you want to show up two nights early in case you get a delayed flight or something. And then when you show up there, then you're just checking in the hotel. You're renting out the car. The whole, like, first day is pretty right. much just, like that and then the second day it's logistics like and logistics stuff. Yeah. yeah you're trying to get rest to get energy for so the wedding the, then, yeah because the next day you got to perform yeah and, and i will say it was nice to get out of the winter and like you know get some sun and yeah, feel that, that feel that energy. You that energy for sure but so. but yeah i mean uh the the reality i mean for for me at least was like okay like i i i dived I've done a couple with with my girlfriend and like my girlfriend came out and turned into a vacation but then you're not making money <laughs> so it's like right. wouldn't you rather just do a vacation and not worry and about not this do wedding the wedding yeah. part not take work with you on your vacation <laughs> right yeah no i hear you and i would think that if you did a lot of those it would be but here's the other thing that about about destination photography that i never really jived with as much mm -hmm. is like i'm basically based in colorado and i do most of my weddings here. I mean, I've done weddings in other states too, but mostly I do them just here in, in Colorado. And so like it, what I found was if I got booked for a wedding, let's say in Colorado on Saturday, and then I got booked for another wedding in another town on a Friday night or a Friday, like that, then I have to shoot the wedding and then leave the wedding, get in a plane, fly back and then do my wedding the next, I mean, like that's logistically is basically not possible. So I ended up make, I could make more money by doing double headers at home than I could by doing the destination thing. So once I realized that, I kind of, 
also abandoned the destination idea. I was thinking that wasn't really something that was going to be. Yeah, yeah the destinations are going to be less seasonal, but at the same time, you know, you're losing out on those double header and triple headers. I look at double headers and triple headers as like the things I, I kind of have to do. Yeah, it's rough, but you got to do it to yeah, make the money I, if you're seasonal. Yeah, I don't think I'll, I'll do triple headers again unless it was like maybe like an elopement. I might do like, one triple header a year, but I don't think I would do more than one. Yeah. Um, yeah, I probably I'm, wouldn't do it after a weekend at a doubleheader too. Yeah, like we'll we'll look at our calendar and kind of analyze what's on the calendar before yeah. we take gigs, and we'll, then we'll tell people if we're booked or not based yeah, on how much we have. Yeah, I think um, yeah going forward, I've kind of decided that twenty is probably my max amount of weddings I'm going to work. I don't think I'm going to book over twenty. I mean, twenty is like, kind of a sweet spot. I feel like yeah. you can easily comfortably handle twenty where you're not making many failures, but you're like making enough money to make ends meet still, and not having to. Yeah ask people for money or anything <laughs> yeah so um our podcast next week is actually pre-recorded so this is our last podcast of uh, 2019 and yeah uh, that's yeah. 2019 we're taking next week off we are christmas, christmas time and but, hanukkah but yeah i thought hanukkah. we could probably talk about a couple of uh, gear purchases that uh that we made this year that kind of oh, improved our cool. improved our photography too so uh I have some kind of an or, unorthodox uh, gear purchases that I like loved more than anything else that I've got, and uh, one of those was actually Nike Free Run RN fly net <laughs> shoes. <laughs> so, I, I, would you I, call sneakers photography gear? I don't know. No, I yeah, know. yeah, for sure. <laughs> yeah, so I, I bought like it feels like you're wearing like like nothing on your feet. I can't wear them in the winter time, but uh, for for all of like the photos I took in Thailand, I would spend about eight hours shooting uh, per day. I mean, having comfy shoes makes a big difference. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah, so I was like walking around um, the streets for eight hours a day. So yeah, when you're doing those long days, yeah, you and that's something you you don't think about. So well, um, mine would probably be a piece of camera equipment. Yeah. I would say the Miticon 35 millimeter f.95 i really like that lens like mm -hmm. it really gives me like a little bit more bokeh but still at a 50 like you can get a lot of bokeh on the fuji still with the yeah. longer lenses but like something shorter like that I, I don't know i really like that lens i really feel like it brought more of my artistic style to the fuji kit and i just love using it i feel like that's probably my favorite thing i picked up this season for sure second favorite thing for me was probably um air buds is that what they're called AirPods? AirPods, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the AirPods. <laughs> so, yeah, uh, the AirPods are great. Yeah. They came out with the, with the AirPods Pro, but for for photographers, like if you're shooting street or something and you're going out and you're wearing those, then you might get run over by a car. So these yeah, are like, it's probably better. These are perfect. Yeah, and, they're um, good. Yeah, Wait. you take one out and it goes mono, so then I can make sure that I'm not about to get hit by a car. So those are right. been my... And then there's no... Uh, the other problem I've always had with... Um, with headphones while I'm shooting is yeah, the, the cable gets wrapped up and way, stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, and then, and then I guess the the third thing that I that I liked the most this year was the A seven three. So, I oh to... yeah, piece of camera. <laughs> oh, I didn't do a second one. Okay, yeah. um, let me think here. The Minicon. Oh, the uh, Fuji little uh, Instax printer that I got. I think that's mm -hmm. kind of a, a hokey thing to say, but like I've been able to print a bunch of wedding photos like on the day for clients and leave them at their table when they sit down for dinner with that thing. And man, my clients love that. that I've gotten like eight positive reviews on the internet from just that one thing. Like I take that printer with me everywhere. I actually picked up a second one that I just keep in the glove box in my car because I just like having it. It's fun <laughs> to make those little prints, you know? Yeah, that's cool. Uh, I used, When I was first starting, I second shot twice, I think. And one of those times, I second shot for uh, this company in Colorado, kind of like a big uh, wedding company, shoots 120 weddings a year. They used to have this projector that they would have at the reception, and they would like uh, load up like previews uh, during like dinner and stuff, and then yeah. they'd put that on the wall and so that's stuff. That's kind of what I do, but I just do yeah. it with the printer. Yeah, yeah it's like a, a much smaller version of that to make people yeah. excited. Yeah, That's and cool. then it always it's funny because like I just thought it would be for the bride and the groom mostly, but like mm -hmm. what happens is all of the bridal party comes around because they're all sitting at the same table, so they pass them around, they all smile and laugh, and yeah, I think it might actually be good publicity too. Yeah, certainly it makes my clients happy though, which makes me happy, obviously. Yeah, but yeah, uh, going from the A seven R R three to the A seven threes, um, the re the reason I kind of did it is because my my A seven R threes they got like a year of like a little bit more than a year of use. So that's like and a situation where you kind of downgraded in a way. In a way, yeah, and the the shutter counts on those were, were going up, and you know I bought those before the A seven three was out, and I kind of regretted buying them, and I was like maybe like less megapixels would work for me. And I was also having this issue where some of the files um, were like green in Lightroom. Like they would have this like green cast and then it was like really slowing me down. It was really weird. Hmm. Um, but then when you- Like on the previews? 
he unlike the previous yeah and then when yeah. you when you export it then they looked normal but it was like this really annoying thing with those and i was like i wonder if the just because of the size of it i don't know yeah i think lightroom was having like problem with like how much information that and, much information yeah, that yeah i don't sense. know it was it was really huh. weird so well, that's was, annoying yeah yeah but yeah i switched to the well and also like like that saves money everywhere. You don't need it nearly as much file space because the file size is yeah. like half the file size, right? It's like fifty. How yeah. big is the R? Um, I think it's uh, forty-two megapixels. It's so goes from half. forty-two yeah. down to twenty-four, basically. Yeah, I mean, that's a big savings. Yeah. So yeah, that's I kind like forty percent. Yeah. That's a lot. Yeah, I bought everywhere. an A seven three on the limb. I was like, oh, this is this is good, and it's better in some ways. Has some better low light and stuff. And you don't have to do as much like yeah. uh, cleaning up a skin and stuff yeah. like that. Like that's stuff you don't really think of until you're doing so many pictures as a wedding photographer, and you're like, yeah, I, having the best camera See, is kind of a pain in this situation. Yeah, for Less sure. Less would be a little more here. Yeah, yeah. but yeah, like. Uh, um, I guess I think uh, of a, a third thing maybe. Oh, third third piece of gear. I would say maybe my uh, Meepo mini skateboard. <laughs> that little yeah. electric skateboard I got. I love that thing. Kind of like the uh, kind of like the comfy shoes. Like I can get from a lot of spots for scouting. It makes it getting around easy. I can throw it in the trunk of my car and carry it easy. But I can go nice. twenty miles an hour on it. Yeah, and nothing gets me around like the parks and stuff. So yeah, the electric skateboard is where it's at. I'd nice. say that's my third favorite piece of gear this year. Yeah. Um, is there anything else that you're looking forward in to in 2020? Or, well, I thought I was gonna have a Fuji F1 lens, but it sounds like that's not gonna happen, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, it sounds like that's I a no-go. I had that in, in my mind. I still have yeah. that in my mind. Yeah, n yeah. Now it's the 50, and it's just gonna be pretty much the same focal length as your 51 point or 56 millimeter 1.2. Yeah, pretty similar. Pretty similar. Yeah, and it probably won't. will take them a couple more years to build it now. It'll yeah, come out next year. So yeah, I don't really know yet. Yeah, you have to see. How about you? You got something on your eyeball in for next year? Not really. I'm pretty pretty satisfied with with everything. I like my lenses. Um, I like my cameras, but I do like just to kind of keep up on the stuff. So I just I guess yeah. I'll just yeah. keep on looking. Yeah, you never know. Cameras. Yeah. So yeah, I think I'll probably shoot one more year on my setup now, and then start to you know contemplate you know what what's next for my for my camera setup. But yeah, pretty happy with right. uh, with everything. So well, that's cool. the end. I'm Happy holidays. Yeah, we're going to go on to End of, break uh, now. 2019. Yeah, go on to break now and then um, come back with a little bit of news. I know Canon yeah, has news. Yeah, more, more Canon rumors. So um, Interesting. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll be right back. Photo footage is currently on break. Hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. And we'll see you every Sunday for a new photo footage podcast. Now back to photo footage. All right, here with the photography, Dan Rather. All right, so uh, this week we have <laughs> we have a Leica Wide Edition M10P. Um, a couple weeks ago, the Ghost one was released, and now this one um, is coming out. There's only going to be 350, but it does come. Can with you get the, a white? Does it come with a white lens? Uh, it's like silver. It's still silver. Yeah. yeah. So I think this is pretty cool. I mean, uh, to own one of 350 uh, uh, of something is cool. Like I like I keep on keep on going back to this, but Leica is just like it's like a piece of art. You just you own it. You look at it. Like you just want to get in there with them. You want to get one of those. You should get yourself a Leica camera, man. And <laughs> you you won't be like, oh uh, no. I mean, Leica's not gonna. I'm hooked. I'm gonna sell everything I own <laughs> no, and buy no. more of their cameras. No, <laughs> I, I think uh, one of the stupidest things photographers do is they go out and buy a Leica camera because I think it's gonna make them better, but it doesn't it's make not. them better. It's not. It's the exact way. same thing, and if yeah. not, it's harder. But but I think it's cool that there's 350 of these. So um, if you want to buy like this is like a piece of art and like kind of display it and like it might actually grow in value over time too. Yeah, but like that would only make sense if you were like a rich guy. Yeah, and you could let it sit on a shelf and like appreciate it for a while. Because if you're like an active photographer and you're running mm -hmm. around with this yeah. white camera, <laughs> you know I mean, this is going to be banged up, yeah. you know? Like, it's not going to oh, look so yeah, good. Yeah, you know, another thing. Uh, you're not going to be able to resell that for much. Yeah, in a another bunch of another years. funny thing about owning this white camera is that it's going to stick out a lot more. So if you have like a black right, Leica, I mean, you, you might not be able to tell from far away that it's like a fancy camera. And so I'm thinking, like, if I'm out in another country shooting and I have this white like uh, that's worth fourteen thousand dollars fourteen yeah, fourteen thousand five hundred dollars i believe is that with the lens uh, with the lens what kind of lens does it come with uh simulax 50 millimeter uh spherical like a one four yeah one point four. four yeah well but, but, i yeah. mean that's like a five thousand dollar lens all by itself so i guess that yeah. i mean that all makes sense yeah you know maybe if you hold on to it for for 10 years and it's one of 350 or 20 years maybe you can yeah. sell it for more maybe but it's if an you're investment. an active photographer and you're using it as your main <laughs> kit all the time yeah. like it doesn't make any sense like 
Yeah. You're not going to be able, like, once it's gone through a couple seasons of life with me, I'm not going to be able to sell it to any, like, a file out there. They're going <laughs> to be like, this thing is junk because you destroyed uh, this camera. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I, I still I still love what Like is doing. It's like uh, owning a piece of artwork and, you know, you can, you know, I like the patina that comes along with owning one from a long time. Like, you're, if, if you get, like, a black Leica and I don't know about, like, the patina on this white one, I feel like it's going to look ugly after a while. Yeah, it's going to be brown. It's going to be beige. Yeah. But, like, if you, like, get, My like, beige a, Leica. <laughs> if you use it, I mean, you know? Yeah. Yeah, but I think like the appeal to to me is like if you buy a black like it's you're gonna use it a lot and then you're gonna see all these this beautiful patina from all the years of use that you had well, it. Maybe you that know, would happen with the white one too, but I don't know. It might just turn There's brown. a reason that Leica only made yeah. three hundred and fifty of them, I think. Yeah. All right, so uh, we have Instagram hiding likes. This has been news for a while, but the new the hiding new hiding likes. Yeah, yeah. So, like, um, I have two Instagram accounts, and on one of them, um, you can't see how many likes I'm getting on them because uh, Instagram started uh, testing, uh, taking away likes for, for all, hmm. basically all pages. I mean, from what I've heard, it's most pages now. And my second photography account um, hasn't had that yet, but you can't see the likes on my um, Nick Sparks photography Instagram. Well, that's kind of so, strange. Like, uh, if you don't have the, the like button, how, how are people going to interact with it? it anonymously, so to speak? Um, you know, it's, uh, well, at first everybody thought that Instagram was doing this for like, like mental health. There's been a lot of uh, things going around for, for mental health. This always seemed fishy to me. I always said like, why would a corporation do Care this? about that. Yeah, yeah. They just want to make money. Yeah. But it comes out and, uh, some employees have said that it's actually to get people to post more because, uh, so the reason that they started, like the people who have really low postings are like, they'd feel like really negative towards it and they don't want to do it anymore. Yeah, so, like, so they, they tested don't see this that, and, that yeah, they're they more just, inclined to do it. Mm -hmm. They tested it first huh. in Australia and, um, and then people started posting more there. So this is what the employees are saying. And so, uh, they want people to post more pictures on Instagram and, you know, spend more time in the app. So, uh, now that the tests have kind of gone good in other countries, they've started doing that in the U.S. Um, you know, like I, I want to say like two months ago, but yeah, the employees are basically. But as so like as a user of another person's page, are you still able to like things then, or that would yeah, just be? Yeah, yeah. It, it so you could still yeah. do it, and it would tally up somewhere you just wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah. So basically, <laughs> on my account, it just says um, like if you. If you're looking at it uh, by yourself, you can see all the likes. Oh, so you can still see your own yeah, stats. Yeah, just other people can't. Can yeah, it's stats. like uh, it's like people can't uh, see. Like only you can see your bank account balance. Other people can't hmm. see your bank account balance. I mean, that's good for Instagram, but that's kind of not as good for us as photographers because sometimes having that large number brings like legitimacy to your to your photography, and people know you're a big photographer because you have you know thousands yeah, or millions those, uh, of photographer credibility or, or whatever. Yeah. So, yeah, social credibility is a big thing, and then huh, um, that's interesting. Yeah, influencers, so photographers making money off of um, selling, uh, basically selling paid uh, sponsorship posts. Like I think that that kind of hurts them a little bit too. I bet you they'll come up with some sort of tool though, so they can still figure out the stats of people for people like that that they could sell them, so they could still do it, like Moz or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. It kind of seems like Instagram or might not. be leaving those people in the dust, but hopefully there's some sort of. Uh, they'll find another way around it. Marketers are smart. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, bottom line, Instagram isn't trying to improve the world. It looks like they're just trying to get people to post more photos because people are <laughs> deleting their photos because they didn't get enough likes and not posting as much. Yeah, and then uh, that's that's unfortunate. Yeah, that's yeah. ah, kind of annoying. <clears throat> yeah. Anyway. All right. So Instagram. Uh, Another heavy Canon uh, news week. So we have a Canon hybrid camera coming, supposedly. This sounds kind of that fishy. That was a to me. rumor, right? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's a rumor. But um, what it's saying is that the moving, it's going to have a moving sensor. So apparently the mount diameter so the for the. Sensor can adjust for the flange, flange distance between mirrorless and the old cards, basically, or the old lenses? Yeah, yeah, totally. Huh. And so it looks like uh, the, since the mount is the same diameter for the R mount and the EF mount, that. Uh, it's gonna. They can basically just do uh, like like a hybrid electronic contact, contacts, and then somehow get both lenses to mount onto the same thing, and then just move the sensor back and forth. And it's saying that this is gonna come in either late 2020 or late uh, 2021. In my mind, this is gonna cause one of two problems. It's either gonna be very con convoluted because it has to move around inside of there, and therefore it's gonna break. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's having like a little, break. Yeah, yeah, like having a little motor attached to my sensor so I could go for a little <laughs> ride, depending on which lens is on it. Yeah. Eventually, is gonna break it. You know, like that's yeah. eventually gonna break the sensor. So, like in my opinion, I'd still rather just have it all fixed. You know? Yeah, it seems weird. Huh. Uh, I 
if they would have came out with this two and a half years ago, they might have kept more users. But now it seems really weird. This is just we- it's weird. It's like a timing. way to compensate for their yeah, lack so, of lenses. Yeah. So if this is uh, if this is like a real thing that's going to happen, it just it. It seems like they're just, you know, lagging far behind, and they should have done this before the A7 III. Yeah, they should have. The they should have. R3. That should have been like their intro to mirrorless, so that, that yeah. all those people could have stayed with their old system. Like re- introducing it now means, like, in my opinion, means you don't have as much faith in your system. Yeah. Like, why would they do that? Why didn't they release one or two lenses with this camera like three years ago? Like that would have made so so much sense. But now doing this this late just seems weird. People have already switched, you know, or they're buying RF mount lenses, and it seems like kind of a like it's if if I bought the Canon R or EOS R, and then I also bought RF lenses, and now they're releasing this like, and I sold off all my EOS glass, my EF glass. Yeah, that'd be then, annoying because then you yeah. probably want to get some of those back. You yeah, I'd be, super, I'd be super annoyed. Yeah, yeah, Canon does some obnoxious things. Yeah, I'm glad I'm out of there. I, yeah, we, me yeah, too. We, just, <laughs> <laughs> I just Sorry, Canon to, Files out there. Uh, we just <laughs> yeah, we just have to talk experience. about it here because yeah. you know, everybody wants to hear about it. Yeah, people like to know about it. out of my mind, thankfully. Anyway, that's uh, interesting. It's just because yeah. the sensor's just going to move around in there. Yeah, weird stuff. Um, yeah. All right, so we got... Um, you know what else is going to come up with that, uh, other than obviously a breaking is they're going to have to come up with some wackety calibration system. Because lots of people are going to be like, my sensor's off, my glass is off. And they used to do like micro twists or tweaks, you know, like to the, yeah. to the, to the lenses, because you could yeah. do micro tweaks to the lenses and the, and the firmware on some of those to adjust them. And now they're going to have to do the same thing with the sensors. Like that's going to be a lot of extra work for technicians. I yeah, think. They're, they're making this way too complicated. Way too complicated. Yeah, and they should have just done this way earlier. So yeah, like, they're just late to the game. Yeah, so we have um, another... Uh, Vivian Mayer, quote unquote. Um, they're calling her the Russian Vivian Mayer. Her name is um, Masha. Is that how you say that? It's a Russian Masha. Name? Masha. Okay. I think it's Masha. I don't yeah. really know. Yeah, me, me either. Um, and then, uh, Masha. yeah, I guess you, you. I'm not even gonna try the last name. It's spelled L U A S H I N T S U V A. And uh, these photos are coming out 20 years after her death. So they're trying to do the same thing. It looks like somebody. Found some uh, found some old photos and to me the photos don't look that good. So I was looking through these. It seems yeah. like people are really trying to kind of bankroll on these dead photographers and trying to exploit people. And I kind of I mean yeah. I only saw some of the pictures, so I can't speak to the whole body of work either. But the ones I saw didn't like wow me. They weren't like yeah, compositionally I saw about great 10. or there there wasn't like a lot of, of of even interesting content matter that made me go oh, wow this is. To me, it's like, I don't know, it seems like a lot of people maybe watched <clears throat> that movie about Vivian Mayer and were like, I'm going to go find boxes of my own yeah. and I'm going to try to do this. And like, it's like a kind of a copycat sort of thing. But in this case, I don't feel like the works is good. Yeah, same here. I feel like the, the first round of Vivian Mayer was really good. So the, the first uh, body of work, it was like, I, I mean, I wouldn't put it up there on like the on like the great list or anything right. but, but i mean but for, a, like, for an amateur like home photographer she was pretty good. yeah yeah I mean, she had a medium round. format camera yeah i feel like um sort of the second book or in like the second one in color kind of went downhill yeah, it's, it's cool. not looking as good but there's some pictures in that first book though that i was really wild about yeah. but i mean like over your course of your career over 20 years if you're shooting all the time you should be able to make a handful of just amazing shots like at least <laughs> you yeah. know even with dumb luck you should yeah yeah so I, it just seems like to me like maybe people are finding a bunch of pictures and they're like maybe yeah. i can just make some money on this yeah that's what it seems like to me too i yeah, mean it's unfortunate huh? yeah i mean if, if it was me though so like if somebody found my pictures years <laughs> after my death like i'd be like okay please do oh it, yeah please that, do it. that's totally yeah, totally yeah good, you know yeah. make some money or whatever but <laughs> you're right to have found that but yeah as a, as a snobby <laughs> photographer looking at these i'm, I'm uh, i feel a little bit judgmental right it's this. easy it's easy to to judge from afar yeah from that land of youtube <laughs> <laughs> so uh 500 pixels uh looks like they have some shady terms that, yeah i saw the yeah. term thing come out this week on petapixel yeah you know i feel like well, like i've i've experienced a couple like not necessarily shady things you're like, kind of a 500 pixel hater right i am they yeah. took me off the platform for trying to promote something that i did so it seems weird that a social media network would take me off the platform for promoting a blog post that i that i wrote when i built up a following on your platform so um i can understand 
you know, like like a it lot of defeats all purpose of being on there. Yeah, you know, some some platform um, sort of curation makes a lot of sense. So like like YouTube, like they can't let like um, you know white nationalists on here like spewing right. all sorts I of mean, crazy yeah, hate stuff be, and stuff. So has that has to be curated. Yeah. But um, if you're you know providing you know your photos to like a social media network, you should be able to promote things that. That, right, um, and I think I'd the... seen some stuff in the terms there that they don't own your pictures per se, but they basically have the rights to do all sorts of things with them. Uh, yeah. Pixels at least. And I, I'm sure some of these other social media companies have similar kind of contracts that none of us photographers read the fine print of because we're busy. And like, I don't know, have you ever read any of the fine print? Like, I mean, no. we mostly just like look over that and say we want to use this service, so we're just in. Yeah, I mean, it's easy to, to not look, look at it and just be like, I want to be on here because yeah, I, I want to like, be on here. Yeah. yeah. So I'm just going to do I whatever. I want my photos to reach more people or, right. or whatever. So. And then at the beginning, maybe if you're not a big photographer, you don't care, but over time, if you become bigger, maybe you do care. Yeah, yeah. These terms look pretty shady to me. So, like, the gist of it seems like they're able to sell your photos until yeah, you take them off there. Too. And that, and, yeah, the only way you could break break the license agreement with them was to delete either your account or remove the photos from their service. Yeah, and it seems weird. What if they sold your photo and they were on, a, like, a monthly license, licensing deal and then you take your photo off? Are they going to keep track of you taking your photo off and, you know, being like, oh, you don't have consent anymore? They're probably just going to assume you're a regular old photographer and you're not going to follow up on it and they can yeah. just keep getting paid. I mean, how would you really even know? Yeah, it seems like, like 500 Pixels is really doing everything they can to try to make money. And, like, I feel, I just feel like they, they took this, like, kind of great service and took, like, a like some weird turns. Like, they tried stock photography. They tried selling photography services. They've tried just so many different things. And it seems like there's people in those offices at 500 Pixels who are just, you know, hitting their heads against the wall. Like, how do we make money? How do we make money? I think that they're, uh, they kind of hit a wall. And instead of, like, maybe selling... Um, you know, ads that are relevant to photographers, like most other social media networks, who you know, who like do like the advertising model. Yeah, they kind of wanted to steer clear of that. They didn't want. I mean, their site is aesthetically yeah. very pretty, and their app is beautiful, and all that kind of stuff. But I feel like by doing that kind of stuff, it kind of drives photographers away. Yeah, it's, it's just really weird. It seems like, like, like the the audience on there are amateur photographers who like landscape photos or like to Photoshop pictures of hot girls um, <laughs> for hours on end. <laughs> and um, I mean, people like to look at that stuff. So yeah, yeah. I mean, people I'm, people photograph. I'm I'm not I guess judging. what people like to see is what yeah. gets seen, especially I, on yeah. pictures. I'm not judging. I don't think that there's very much meaning behind those photos. I've taken plenty of photos of hot girls and stuff like that. And um, I mean, you know, it could be meaningful, but it depends on how you do it and in like what situations. Yeah, it depends on... You definitely do want to try to invoke a feeling. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so, I, I don't know. But, yeah, it seems like this model that they're trying to work on is just ever, you know, just expanding, and they're just trying all this stuff, just throwing stuff at the wall, and it's just like, man, pick, you know, like, figure out something that's relevant to your audience. So these uh, photographers, amateur photographers who are selling landscape photos or uh, taking photos of models and stuff, like, what would they actually want? They're not going to be able to sell, like, most of their landscape photos as, like, stock photography uh, photos, I don't think. And so I, I just don't get their model. And it seems like now they're just, like, trying to figure out um, how to write things into their terms. I hope that's not what they're doing. Yeah, so. that's the thing. It's like if you yeah. come back on you get, and you update the terms, you'll see that there's some stuff in there you may not want to actually agree to. And I don't know if it it's retroactive, if it goes back on photos you posted prior to agreeing on that or not. That'd probably be something worth looking into. But yeah, it seems like 500 Pixels is doing some shady stuff. Yeah, so uh, lastly in the news, it's almost Christmas time, so let's Christmas talk uh, Christmas photos, I guess. Yeah, Christmas photos. <laughs> I think every yeah. year when I'm trying to make Christmas photos, I'm always trying to like invoke a feeling and stuff. And mm -hmm. this time of year, I always get like a handful of engagement sessions, and I actually had a, a wedding last weekend, which was kind of had a you know, holiday theme to it, but it wasn't yeah. like Christmas per se, but like they use lots of kind of stuff like that. And I love shooting that kind of themed feeling kind of wedding because I can try to like make pictures a specific way. I'll like try to shoot through wreaths or I'll try to like find uh, Christmas lights that are on a tree somewhere that I can make as cool bokeh or, you know, I'll try to take that kind of scenery that's around me and put it into my photos. Nice. Yeah. I don't have any, uh, any weddings uh, around Christmas time, time this year. So I guess I'm just kind of uh, sitting back and, uh, not doing too many Christmas photos, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I suppose like the other. Um, but over the course of your life, I'm yeah. sure you've been out in the in the seasons doing Christmas photos from time to time, right? Or at least yeah. in the holiday season. Yeah, around it for for sure. Maybe not themed, but like yeah. in the season, and yeah. it's around like in the city and stuff. 
Yeah, you know, uh, Christmas bread is kind of a nightmare for me. Um, <laughs> it's uh, it's bright and very overwhelming, and so you know, uh, messing with those reds uh, when when I do do them is always is always a hassle. You know, bringing down the saturation, uh, especially when you reds. have like people's skin tone in it, because there's a lot of red uh, in people's faces a lot. Yeah. So like when you mess with that, it tends to mess with their faces more than you want it. Yeah, yeah, um, but yeah, I, I can't think of too many clients that have been. Uh, you know, decked out in like elf gear or anything, but that'd be interesting. <laughs> yeah, I always like doing the uh, holiday thing. I also think other than yeah. doing like something themed is sometimes like you, in, at least in Colorado, we have a lot of these like really beautiful like landscapes and stuff. Mm -hmm. And uh, oftentimes I'll go up into the mountains and I'll get the beautiful mountain look or uh, yeah. sometimes I'll go up with couples onto like a ski lift and we'll do the whole, the whole snowboarding skiing down the mountain kind of engagement session. And sometimes we'll have this, uh, there's this one up at the Evergreen Lake House in Colorado where they, uh, they they freeze the lake every year and it, you know, it's all frozen over and they do ice skating on the lake. Yep. And I've done a few engagement sessions there and I always think that, oh, that turns out really kind of cool. Because yeah. yeah, it's still kind of holiday, but it's not yeah. like so like in your face, like <laughs> snowmen around and stuff, yeah. you know what I mean? So it, yeah. I, I like to kind of get those pictures. Those are always invoke like a nice holiday feel. Yeah, this is probably the time of year where people take the most family photos. So um, yeah, yeah you, you're a new dad. You've been um, photographing your kid for about a year and a half now. Yeah. Is, yeah, do you have any tips for the for the uh, photographers out there during the holidays? Yeah, well, one thing that I really like to do is I like to try to get a lot of detail shots of things, like uh, things for that around for the holidays, like decorations for Christmas trees, or uh, I also like to get, like, if people are making cookies or that, that kind of thing, I like to yeah. get close-up kind of shots of that. But I also like to try to get pictures, like, I had a whole photo session where I had my daughter, like, decorating the tree. Oh, and that's I cool. And I used, like, a long yeah. lens, like an 85 the whole time at 1.2, so I could get that tree kind of, like, blurred out behind and yeah. make cool pictures of her decorating it and stuff. And then she was had something to do, so she wasn't focused on the camera, but I could still make cool pictures. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, stuff like so that. If you are out there with the kid, um, with the kiddo, maybe uh, have them uh, decorate the tree and take some photos yeah. of it or have them help out with cookies. Um, yeah, making yeah. the cookies too. You That's another kind of, great shot. Yeah, you can uh, create more meaningful photos um, if yeah. you kind of, um, you know, bring some real life into into them instead of just uh, your kid smiling at the camera. I think exactly. uh, when yeah. you look back at those, it's going to be cooler to, to see uh, her decorating the tree and stuff. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, I try to kind of set up those sorts of things for the photos. Yeah, yeah, it's super cool. All right, well, um, yeah, this was uh, photo footage, and we will see you next time. Yeah, happy holidays. Happy uh, New Year's.